to the fifth time. Welcome to the Fifth Kai TV, and today we're talking to Matthew Lacroix. He's an author and a researcher. His books are The Stage of Time and The Illusion of Us. Matthew researches mysteries of the past, ancient civilizations. He writes about the intelligent universe, quantum physics, string theory, geology. Uh, he's a Renaissance man. So you're listening to me, Paul Wallace, talking to Matthew Lacroix. Matt, welcome to the Fifth Kind. Hey, it's great to be here, Paul. I'm so excited to talk to you tonight. It's great to meet you. I've really enjoyed reading your material. And uh, as I've been reading what you're researching and the things that you're putting out there, I keep thinking, oh, my goodness, we could have written each other's books because our fields of interest uh, line up so much topic after topic. Uh, I want to begin by asking you, the things you're writing about, they are things that certainly were not on the syllabus when I went through school. And they were probably not on the syllabus when you went through school. So Definitely not. <laughs> tell us, how did you get into these amazingly interesting fields of study? Well, thanks so much for having me here, Paul. Um, my journey's been probably a lot, uh, quite similar to many others, where you go through early academic, your academic career in um, you know, middle school into high school and then eventually into college. And along the way, I, I started to really question the things that I was learning. I remember being in history of school and you know almost falling asleep because it was just this very mundane, boring version of all these events that have happened. And it was there was nothing exciting about it, right? We were we were just simply told that where you know human civilizations um, started six thousand years ago, and that we slowly linearly moved our way up to where we are now. And there's no there's no mystery to it. There's no secrets. That's all. And I remember being. Um, I guess internally disappointed because something felt like there was so much more. And it wasn't until I started to get into high school and then into college that I really started to dabble and look into some of these, these aspects of ancient history, the nature of reality, energy, all these different aspects to make me start paying attention to, hey, maybe there are all these other things that were deliberately not being told. And when I was really delving into it when I started to look into the stories of like Robert Temple with the Dogen and how they knew secrets of Canis Major and Sirius. And then looking into these, the fantastical the designs, the fantastic designs that go into the pyramids of, of Egypt and how they're mathematically um, created to be precise harmonic frequency generators and all these aspects. It completely blew my mind. I remember being yeah. outside on a summer day and just sitting there reading a book and just being, just having my mind completely blown and sitting there just trying to scratch my head to try to wrap my head around the idea of, okay, so there's this entire other side of human history, these secrets of ancient civilizations that were far more sophisticated than we've been told. And that all exists out there. And most people aren't aware of it because it is what it's one of these aspects that is, uh, a tightly guarded narrative that we're taught in school, and it doesn't include all these other aspects that we're starting to under, understand now. And that, and that, to me, led down, like you probably, this great rabbit hole where we, as you start looking into one thing, it tumbles into the next thing, and before you know it, you're so deep in it that the people around you think that you've totally lost your mind. And, and that's, I think that's, that's the way that a lot of us go down this road, right? That's exactly right. I think as soon as you start uh, reading, and uh, looking above the parapet, there are so many hooks that, that start reading you into all these different areas. But I'm just, I wonder, because it, in my experience, I remember sitting in school like you, uh, looking around and thinking, is everybody else buying this? And I remember doing that at the age of five when I was in a, in a church school and, and I noticed how they were using Christianity to get us to behave and I thought that was a bit a bit poor and then the next thing that happened for me was when I was 11 I chanced across a book that had an alternative narrative and that was Eric von Daniken's Chariots of the Gods okay those those are sort of the two things that 
dislocated me and got me thinking more critically about what we were being told. What was it for you? What was it about Matthew Lacroix that meant he could sit in a classroom and look around and think, no, this is not, why is everyone else satisfied with this? Why were you not satisfied? Do you, do you is, have an that's, idea? That's a great point. Um, I think that there are certain individuals who are just not part of that, you know, the cliques and the groups and being part of this normal um, high school environment that we're part of where you, you, that I'm not the person that went out and, you know, was valedictorian, going to the prom, going to these sports events, doing all of this stuff. I, I wasn't that person at all because I saw no connection to it at all. I saw a place where everybody was acting fake. People were just trying to fit in and they weren't expressing themselves. There was no imagination. There was no wonder in this incredible world around us. I was a hugely um, passionate person about nature and getting outside. And so when people were doing these sporting events and whatever it was after school, I would just head up into the mountains or some, somewhere and go take a hike or whatever it was. Because to me, being out in nature and the, the purity and the balance of nature, it made so much more sense to me. The quiet of having your mind think and not being bombarded by the noises of cars going by and wireless signals blasting th you know, through your head and you don't even realize and all of a sudden you're you're wondering, like, why can I think straight? Why, why are so many things so foggy around me? And I remember actually once um, going on a backpacking trip for four days out in the middle of the wilderness. And, and when I came back, um, that perspective, I never forgot it the rest of my life. Because I remember sitting in my car in a, in a busy urban area, and it was almost appalling to me to, to imagine that we exist in such an unbalanced and poisonous place where most of the food we consume lowers our vibrational energy and affects us in a very negative way. But yet those same foods and all, and all those things are promoted and pushed on us. And then at the same time, this TV, this box that is telling us what to watch is just showing us all of these very materialistic viewpoints of people being as attractive as possible. The most, everything was focused on this physical obsession. And all these things just to me felt like background noise. And I wanted to run away from it as far as I possibly could. And, and I, so you brought up a good point about being a different individual and having these moments where you're, you're being pushed into this system of conforming, but you don't want to, you resist. And, and so it really comes down to, well, how long did that individual resist for? Or did they just come back to this path later on in life? And I, in many ways, um, became very frustrated with the, the world around me and, and, the, and the corruption, the darkness. And it wasn't until I started delving into understanding the past and cycles of energy and consciousness that it all, it was like a light bulb going off, realizing that we have this entire system in place to keep people in this very organized, um, lower vibrational state where everyone is thinking on the same page and is going to work every day and is not questioning every, anything. And and all of a sudden that just exploded. And I realized that here we have a system that's being deliberately maintained to keep order in society so that people don't yeah. look into these secrets because what would have, what would happen if they looked into these secrets, everything in their life would change. Yeah. I, th that's an amazing story. I think uh, I want to uh, hone in on something that you said there about your four day retreat. Sure. Uh, out, out in nature, out in the forest, because I actually think that is a very helpful uh, thing for people to know about, that there's something amazingly grounding and healing about being out in nature, being away from the television, as you say, being away from all the images that entrain us, but also being in nature, being grounded, breathing the air, being around trees, there's something about that that recalibrates people. And it, it grounds you in a way that you can begin to get some clarity. And if you're in it for four days, uh, most people, if they went on a four-day retreat, would come back with a different perspective on the day-to-day -day grind that they're part of. And right. sometimes when people talk in terms of uh, raising their vibrational level or achieving a higher state of consciousness. It can sound very remote and difficult and technical and how on earth do I do that? But actually taking a walk in a forest 
uh, goes a long way to changing some gears for you. And I'm now realizing, looking back on the production of my most recent book, which is Escaping from Eden, that really flowed out of a lot of time walking in the forest. And it wasn't by design. I was doing it because I was uh, in between jobs. I was needing to depressurize after the previous one. And so I was spending some time in my local forest. And I now look back and realize that a whole lot of fresh thinking and remembering the anomalies that I, I wanted to look at came out of that time in the forest. So there really is a connection between your time in nature and your clarity of mind in, in the studies that you make. So I want to go back to you while you're, you're still at school, you're beginning to dislocate from the, uh, the main meta-narrative that we get taught. Can you remember what was the first anomaly or unanswered question that you thought, no, I'm really going to need to look at that for myself? Was there one that really got you going? Um. Really, I think the thing that started this this whole path, because is there, you're going to separate the idea of being curious about something to being driven by that spark that that goes off where you say, OK, I can't I can't um, disprove this at all. In fact, it doesn't make any sense with the logical thinking that we've been given on the past. And really, I mentioned a lot, but I think the Dogen was was the big spark for me. The Dogen tribe, for those who I mentioned many times, but for those who don't know, there's a there's a remote tribe in Mali, Africa called the Dogen, and the Dogen is this, are this very strange group who practice all of these rituals where they go way up on these big sticks so they can be extremely tall, but more importantly. They had these certain elders that have been chosen in, in their community. And the elders, the whole job behind them, not only is to um, guide the community itself, but they were actually tasked with carrying down the knowledge from their, the previous elder that came before them. And they did it in such a strict way that they would actually isolate themselves because they knew that polluting thoughts and other information could cause this incredibly valuable information they knew to disappear. And so they would isolate themselves and they would pass this on every generation. And what were they passing on? Well, the Dogen people have this incredible story about how they um, were given very detailed information and influences long ago to learn not only everything about our solar system, but about other solar systems, um, specifically the Sirius um, solar system that's in K the, the Canis Major constellation. And so this, 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 the, the Sirius system itself, what makes it so incredible is that the Dogen weren't discovered by the outside world until the 1930s when some French anthropologists came into the, to Mali, the country of Mali and they found them. And they were astonished because the Dogen knew all these detailed um, descriptions of Sirius A, B, and C, and, and how they all rotated around each other and the entire um, Canis Major system. They had all this detailed information about. The problem was in the 1930s, the Dogen, they didn't have a telescope. They didn't have any means to, to, to have a way to magnify and look into the sky. So how could they have known that? And more importantly, they um, they saw series B and C, and series B hadn't even been discovered yet. And it was like later on, they discovered it with a radio telescope, and they were like, basically, wow, the Dogen were right all along. And so... How could they they had a they had a precise description, didn't they, of Sirius B? Very, very just precise. They knew almost everything about it. We're not talking about just something where someone was able to view it from a distance and come up with just some theories. It's like they were told very, very detailed information about this star system. And when the Dogen were asked about how they came up with this knowledge, they didn't say they 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 found it. They were they said they were told this knowledge from they called them the beings they called the nomo and the nomo if you look into the description of the nomo and the pictures that were drawn of them look exactly like this these images from mesopotamia of the same symbolic references of some of these ancient influences that influenced those civilizations as well and the more you dig into it the more you find out the dogen were originally from egypt and that they had they had escaped egypt to avoid religious persecution so just like that rabbit hole mentality, 
it just keeps going deeper and deeper into these these secrets of ancient history before you realize it you you have to just step back and say to yourself wow so ancient civilizations instead of being more primitive were in some ways more advanced than we are and they may it may not just be one civilization civilizations may have come and go because of disasters and that's why one of the reasons why we're in the place we're in today that's is an amazing story the story of the dogon the fact that the information they shared with the anthropologists in the 1930s was information we didn't yet have uh, in our astrophysics of the time and we've now been able to confirm it do you think that the the dogon people said they got this knowledge from people who lived around sirius c do you think they got that knowledge while they were still part of Egyptian society? Are they part of, do they come from the Egyptian priesthood? Is that how you would regard their roots? Well, they don't specifically say that they got the knowledge in Egypt, as far as I know. I, I do, no. they do, they do stay, they do state that the Nomo was the one who departed, who imparted that knowledge on them. Now, that Nomo figure is identical to Oannes, that figure in Mesopotamia you find that has what yes. they call this aquatic fish suit. So for a long time, people would be like, well, is that some kind of a strange aquatic being? And it seemed like the truth was sort of muddied, the, the waters were muddied with all of this confusion around, around symbolism, how to separate something that's symbolic from what it actually really means. And so the more I started to dig, the more I started to connect those same symbols to this ancient Sumerian um, god called Enki or Ea, who was the one we think of who, where, who was a, a messenger of, of wisdom and knowledge and who had those symbols. And so, and, but this is what is, it was absolutely incredible that just kept pulling me in is that when you look at the type of hat that was worn by Awanas and, and the Nomo, it was the miter hat that became the modern day Pope hat. It was the same yes, thing. Yes. So it means that the, um, the religious institutions we see now were actually just basing all of most of their knowledge and, and a lot of their important symbolism on these ancient symbols from the past. So how could they not be real if they're just they're, you can still be found today? You know what I mean? It, it was it was really incredible to see all that. Exactly. exactly. I think the persistence of certain uh, motifs in art and certain symbols. Is, is a fascinating field all its own. And of course, when you see these symbols recurring, a couple of questions get thrown up. And one is, when the Pope wears his mitre, does he know where that shape came from? Does he know uh, the, the body of knowledge that that shape is referring to? I think that's very intriguing. I'd like and to say then, yes, because of, the, because of the Vatican archives and how many secrets yes, are Yes, well, exactly. There. <laughs> exactly. I want to come on to libraries, secret libraries, a, a little bit later. But the other question, of course, about these symbols is how connected were these ancient civilizations? Because there are images that recur all around the world from culture to culture where we think there's, there was no contact between those cultures. So already we, we've talked about uh, Mali and the Dogon people, ancient Egypt, Sumeria, and in the knowledge and in the symbols, there's clearly a connection between those cultures. So just starting with the Dogon people, you're already studying three cultures. And the Babylonian, you mentioned Oannes. I love that story because this is, this is one where um, Carl Sagan weighed in, in, in his early days, in the 1960s. Love Carl Sagan. He was very interested in the Babylonian mythology of Oannes and the Apkalu, and the idea that there was prehistoric contact with a species from somewhere else in the universe who came and, in that story, nurtured the beginnings of human civilization. And I wonder, when, when you look into the past, when you look at the roots of our ancient civilizations, how involved do you think an ET presence may have been in our story? And was it just in terms of giving us tech, teaching us about banking and money, or were they more involved even than that in shaping us as we are? What conclusions have you reached, Matt? That's a pretty loaded question. Um, let me start by just, by just st st giving a little background on this before I move into that. Um, 
I firmly believe, based on the evidence, that there have been cycles of civilizations that go back far beyond 12,000 years ago, and that the greatest civilizations that passed on a lot of, of the megalithic knowledge and the building knowledge we see like in the pyramids, they were before 12,000 years ago, and, and they were wiped out. And so I think there are these, these different segments of time periods where the evidence clearly shows that we had a golden age of civilization where knowledge was, was shared by, by cultures all across the world. And there was some kind of a global connected civilization. You know, people have thrown out the idea of something called Atlantis because Plato in the Timaeus and Critias specifically mentions Atlantis. And then we see this, this megalithic building, meaning large stone, precise building that, that could have been, it would have been completely the hardness factor in bronze age tools would have been impossible to carve some of these incredible pieces of granite that are so that are so difficult to carve with those tools and so we used all over the world i started to see these connections with these civilizations all around all around the planet in countries from from the inca in south america all the way over into baalbek lebanon and up through and down into mesopotamia and egypt and all the way around the world and when i started to, to really look at that I started to look at the symbolism that's shared by those civilizations. And that's where this symbolic um, journey for me began. And I really delved, jumped right into it with both feet when I started really talking about the eagle and the serpent. Now, um, we, we can get into that later in the show. and We can talk all about how that's shared. But just to pre preface that, the eagle and the serpent symbolism can be shown in ancient cultures all around the world. From all the way down to the Inca up through the Maya and the Aztec, and then all the way across the world through Mesopotamia and down to Egypt. It's all shared by these symbols. How could they have the same symbols if they wasn't, wasn't a common influence at one time? Now, now getting back to what you were, I just wanted to start by saying that. Now, getting back to what you were saying, I guess I wouldn't really label myself that you, I don't use some of these polluted terms. So I don't really use the word alien. And I don't, I try to avoid the idea of connecting all of this with trying to lump it all together with like UFOs. I think there's a lot of complicated things going on in our reality, a lot of advanced technology, things like the military has, and all aspects of that, and understanding advanced cultures and how they would perceive another, another society in terms of not polluting their timeline. But what, so what, I, what I've come, de come to the conclusion of after studying ancient Mesopotamian tablets, Mayan codexes, um, ancient e Inca symbols, um, e Egyptian writings, everything is that these gods, these gods that seem to have influenced all of these cultures around the world from Awana, Awanas in, in Mesopotamia, all the way to um, when we're looking at the Nomo with the Dogen, it seems to all be the same influences. Now, who are these gods that we've been, that have been called throughout history? Mm. It seems to me based on all the, the little amount of knowledge we know is that some kind of superior beings came here. And I don't think they came here necessarily with some kind of a, they didn't, I don't think they necessarily flew down and landed with some ship. Like we, 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 we commonly just jumped to, it seems like these beings were existing in, in other dimensions outside of ours and that they came according to the Atrahasis and um, a lot of the other tablets they came here seeking immortality and eternal life and the, the, to have, get away from the bondage of having to die and then having to reincarnate again and forget almost everything you know and having to start over. It seemed like they were obsessed with immortality and finding a way to live forever. And when they came here, um, they found a place where the energy of our planet, you talked about how powerful it is to walk out in nature. I don't think that's necessarily shared by every single planet that exists everywhere in the cosmos. I think some planets, and ours has been called Gaia, I think some planets have a very, very powerful um, energy center that um, both feeds life, but also can be used for energy. And I think that that was what their, their real obsession was with coming here, was that we had, I don't think it was about gold. Think, I think that that was a mistranslation. I think it was about energy, immortality, and seeking a way to um, essentially live forever. And I and that's what a lot of the tablets really state. If you go and read them, is that 
before human beings were here, there was a perfect balanced world. And when they came, they brought unbalance with them. And that's what, and that's what the Gnostics say as well. And they, and they state that these, these beings created mankind to alleviate the workload of the gods. And they talk all about how um, originally these Ajiji, these ancient, ancient beings, they had this lower class of Ajiji, had to clear these lifelines, these river channels. And we, and we know what those are now. They were the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers in the Mesopotamian area. But it specifically mentions that they did that for thousands of years until they revolted. That famous story that, that we see in other culture came from the Andrahasis. And it says that they put down the, their tools and they decided to revolt and that the gods had to call them gods, the Anunnaki gods. And they had to decide to alleviate the workload by creating a mortal man with their own essence. So we essentially, if you read the tablets, we became them. So when we look, when we think to ourselves, well, we've been made to believe that we're just an evolved ape. Um, really, you should probably look in the mirror a little closely because it might surprise you if you if you read about ancient ancient stories. <laughs> yes, that that narrative of our being a fusion of Earthling and um, parents Sky from people. some other place, yeah. Sky people, that occurs in mythologies all around the world, and it repeats. Sky in so many iterations, it's, I begin to wonder why that hasn't become the mainstream story when every culture has a version of it. I mean, India, Greece, Norse, how do we keep it out? But uh, it's a story that keeps repeating though. I'm very intrigued by how this story of our origins keeps resurfacing and it often resurfaces uh, in story. Uh, there are so many movies that people will have watched where there's a version of this story in it, whether they're watching Planet of the Apes or Tarzan or uh, The Jungle Book. The story keeps resurfacing. Uh, but do you have an idea about where, where our school story, uh, how it occupies the center stage? Sure. These other narratives are kept to the fringe so that if you start talking about it, you're regarded as, as being on the fringe. What, if there's so much agreement, why isn't it the mainstream story? So this is what I've pieced together in terms of what happened. When you look at when what we think of as the pure religion, what was known as the old religion, it, was a, it predated Christianity. And it related to understanding spirituality and, and the essence of who we are and related to the universe. That Those teachings... There was a point in history when those became hijacked. And that same point in history is where I believe that this story as well became hijacked. And I, you can trace that to what was called the Holy Roman Empire. And it meant that you had this time period where the, the most powerful empire in history was collapsing due to their unsustainable nature. Hint, hint. And they decided that the easiest way to continue this, this progression of staying powerful was Constantine the first in Constantinople, the city that was named after him in Turkey, he decided this, this brilliant idea that was probably not even his at all, but he orchestrated it. And it was revolving around, okay, we used to be, um, any, we used to be completely against Christianity. Anyone that was a Christian, we would burn at the stake. But then they, and then the, the Roman empire within a couple of years of that decided to change roles. And if you, if you weren't a Christian, you were burned at the stake. And so they had, the Holy Roman Empire became the Holy Roman Empire when they adopted Christianity as their official religion. And that's how that's where this whole thing starts, because the Holy Roman Empire is the one that then went around burning chur churches and libraries like the Library of Alexandria and destroying all these ancient remnants on the, on, around the world because they were seeking very one spe very specific thing. They knew in that famous quote, right? He who controls the past controls the future. They realize that if they destroy any of the ancient writings that predate what they think of as the modern Christian Bible, they were they would able to just to rewrite the narrative. So they destroyed ancient tablets, ancient records, all these writings and all these papers that have been rolled up and hidden. They destroyed them all or they kept them somewhere locked away and they were able to cleanse the world of all of this competing evidence and then create their own narrative. And so they yeah, went along yeah. with this idea of that human civilizations were only 6,000 years old. 
they emerged out of the Fertile Crescent and that they slowly developed agriculture and mathematics and all of these things. And then here we are, boom, we became became what we are. And there's nothing s- secret about it, right? We're just we're yep, just yep. apes that fought for thousands and thousands of years. And then slowly we became more civilized. And then we discovered all of these wonders of the universe. That is I, not I, right <laughs> at all. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And what's interesting in my book, Escaping from Eden, I look at how the Christianity that Constantine uh, adopted uh, was a particular strand within Christianity that right at the beginning, there was a big debate about what role the the current version of the Hebrew scriptures should, should play in Christianity. And embedded in that debate was a discussion about the story of our origins, because there were a lot of significant church fathers who were arguing for a worldview that included a far more populated universe and interaction with other species in in the beginning of our story. And they they found all this through Plato. And that was part of the mainstream Christian conversation until about 144 AD when some votes went the wrong way and the other story was accepted. We are alone in the universe. We began very recently yeah. God's in charge, uh, and then the civil authorities are under God, and you and I, our role is simply to obey everything that we're told. That was the narrative that we sort of bought into. So that had formed fairly neatly and tidily by the time Constantine thought, oh, I could put this to work. <laughs> I can yeah. work with this. That's a form of religion that's very helpful to state powers. We'll go with that. And so there's a very interesting period in history when what you and I are talking about was mainstream conversation, and then it got pushed out. Uh, so there's there's just so much that's going on in that. And you can see uh, in the story of empire and conquests that extinction of older knowledge is a yeah. motif that repeats time and time again. You mentioned the Library of Alexandria, not the only library ever to no, have been many others. Yeah. accidentally destroyed, but many, many others. And then that pushes some of this knowledge into esoteric groups, groups that have to sort of live in secret and archive their literature secretly to yes. keep this knowledge alive. I want to come back to an earlier thing you said, though, which is really intriguing, where you were talking about Oannes and the Atkalu and how they're described as sort of semi-aquatic. But we have to decode the, yeah. the symbolism and the images and could it be that something else was seen and it was described in those terms? So you raise the question of how do we decode these ancient symbols and motifs? So when you come to Egypt, say, and you've got uh, figures, that, that these god, god figures who are human-like and then there's a bird's head or human-like and then there's a dog's head. How do we read that? Is that a, an expression of an, uh, of an interdimensional being that we've interpreted? Is, did, were there people wandering around with dogs' heads or with birds' heads? How do we translate that? What does that mean? That's, that's a great question. I think um, Manly P. Hall wrote it really, really well when he said that, um, and I, I'm paraphrasing, when you know society discovers the secrets of symbolism, a great veil will be lifted where all of a sudden we'll realize the truth that has existed right in front of our eyes all along. And that truth is, I think most of these images like you described are just purely a symbolic way. So you brought up the bird head in Egypt. You're, you're referring to the ancient god known as Thoth, and his head was the head of an ibis. Now, if you look into the ibis, this, it's, it was a bird that represented um, higher wisdom and knowledge, this very patient bird that was very careful in, in, in deciding on the next move it would make. It would never act um, out, of, out of line. It was, it was the symbol that was chosen to represent him because it was a symbol of wisdom, patience, um, obtaining knowledge. And so that, that was just a symbol of, his, of, of why that was on his head. And other symbols can mean other things. Some of these gods were very warlike. Some of them, some of them were gods of the underworld. And so they would have symbols that represented that. Every single time we find these symbols, it is is telling us a story about who they were and what they represented. And I think that the 
the deepest part of this that I really would love to just get into and talk about is, well, so Awana is, is, is referencing and, and the Nomo is referencing this aquatic being, being that represents um, like a fish. Well, when you start looking into ancient Sumer, you find that this god Enki was of the fresh waters in the ocean and his symbol was a fish. And one of his symbols was a fish. And that, that to me, helps you to connect, well, who was, who was that that influenced them? But the, the two biggest symbols that I write about very, very, very extensively in my, in my books, uh, the latest book, The Stage of Time, is this idea that there's actually two principal symbols that may be the most important of all. And they have somewhat ruled our civilizations throughout history. And that is the eagle and the serpent. Now, those two symbols are very, very curious because like so many things in our history, um, I believe they'd be completely inverted to their opposite meanings. And so when we think of it as a serpent in the biblical version of the serpent is this evil snake that tempts Adam and Eve with the knowledge of good and evil. You wouldn't want that. And at the same time, the serpent is considered this demon figure that's that's always, always portrayed in, in evil light in this day and age in, in modern society. And at, the, and at the same time, the eagle is this savior, this, this helper, this guardian. And everyone's like, oh, that's so wonderful. I'm so glad that my national bird is an eagle. But uh, if you actually go into it and you really look at the history of what those symbols meant, you find out that those two symbols were completely inverted later on. The Roman Empire had a, had a very big hand at inverting those symbols. And the evidence to prove that is when you look at St. Patrick's Day. Because St. Patrick's Day... The story of St. Patrick's Day is the ultimate proof that those symbols were inverted. Because you mentioned that group, some of the last groups in our history that have still practiced these old ways, these old teachings. And to me, that last great group was known as the Druids. And they were persecuted and hunted down by the Roman Empire. Well, in the story of St. Patrick's Day, St. Patrick, by the way, his father was a Roman soldier, a, a high end soldier. St. Patrick was tasked with the church in cleansing Ireland of snakes, okay? Snakes, evil snakes. And when you just do a little bit of research into Ireland, you find out that snakes have never lived there. It's once again, <laughs> these symbols, right? That's and right, so you right. look into it. And so St. Patrick was ridding the snakes from Ireland. Well, who were the snakes? The snakes were just the symbol, the symbolic name that was used for the Druids or any pagan group. And so therefore, okay, so... These groups were, were, were practicing harmony with the universe and nature, higher spiritual conscious teachings in the ways, the old ways of the past. That sounds pretty evil to me. Whereas on the, on the flip side, the eagle was supposed to be this bird of freedom. But if you but at the same time, when I started to look into it, every single empire throughout history, when you follow these flags, had this eagle on it. And so quickly, I started scratching my head being like, okay, so what does the eagle really represent? Well, the, and this may be difficult for anyone who's listening to, listening to places like the United States or a lot of these other empires that either used to be around or are still around today. And that's what the United States is. And I live there. It's, it's, definitely, a, it's definitely a war empire. But anyway, so the, the eagle represents ultimate power and control. And, the, and it was a masculine power and control, whereas the serpent was more of a feminine energy, creation energy, knowledge, wisdom. And so those two, those, and, and earth. So you think of it as like the serpent as this energetic spiritual energy of earth and the, and the eagle being like the controlling aspect of higher dimensions and overviewing everything in our reality. And those two symbols can actually be traced all the way back to ancient Mesopotamia and Sumer with these ancient gods that we mentioned and how they each had those, those symbols carried on. And so... The more I started to look into that and seeing those symbols all around the world, the Maya and the Aztec worshipped these serpent dragon gods. And, and I got to bring up just a quick thing mm -hmm. is the dragon is simply just the metamorphosis of the serpent. Wings represented a metamorphosis, just like for anyone who doesn't believe this still, if the serpent is so evil, then why does the medical caduceus symbol have the serpent interwoven? And one of exactly. our most prized exactly. symbols of all, right? That's right. And you can see um, there's a more complicated story around the serpent when you begin looking closely. And, and that symbol of the serpent as a symbol of healing, that's been there. You can find that on the walls of hospitals with Christian foundations. 
that's the symbol they'll use. And in the current form of Genesis, there are some little clues that there's a bit more going on with this serpent than we've been told, because the current translation is very curious, because in the current version where we tell it as a God story, the serpent is the one who's actually wanting to upgrade human consciousness, That's right. upgrade That's right. human intelligence. That's where the story and, comes and, from. Yeah, and then the God character it comes in and says, no, I don't want humans that smart. Well, you read that and you know there's something else that can't be quite right. <laughs> it's the question and, is, who is that God figure, right? Exactly. And as soon as you drill down into the translation questions, as soon as you pluralize the word Elohim in Genesis, a whole other story emerges and you realize that these presences are not what we thought they were. And I want to come back to this, this question of, of upgrading human consciousness, because yeah. if people go to your website and look at all the things that you're into, they might look and say, well, goodness, what's the connection between quantum physics, string theory, consciousness, ancient civilizations, cycles of extinction. How on earth do all these tie together? Well, what I find really interesting is that two and a half thousand years ago, all those things were present in the thinking of Plato. Yeah. Plato saw, saw the connection with all of them. And in fact, some of the, um, the conclusions he presents, he ties specifically to higher states of consciousness. He wrote two and a half thousand years ago that the material universe exists in order for consciousness to express itself. Yes. And in your research, you are finding evidences in today's science that really support that and help us go further with that concept. So tell, tell us a little bit about how you got into that line of research and what it means, because it can sound very abstract, conscious universe, intelligent universe string theory we have an idea of yeah. what it is but what does it really mean and what's the use of it so it's all comes down to the idea of understanding the nature of reality and energy and that was where i had to fill in my knowledge to understand because that was what these ancient cultures were obsessed with that was what they were focused on and they and they realized that the ancient Egyptians especially realized they, they called the material world Ka and they called the, 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 the spiritual realm and the creative imagination side of our reality, they called it Ba. And they, and they stated that basically these two sides of reality are battling against one another for one to become dominant. And the side of Ka, this, this physical reality that we exist in, is the one that was perpetuated and pushed on us for so long that we actually forgot really who we are and we became almost trapped in these bodies thinking that that's all that life is when in reality we're part of a system where we are infinite eternal energy and that we, like you said we're here to just experience a physical life with physical consequences because there aren't physical consequences in the non-physical world because you can't die it, energy is eternal so it really doesn't matter what decisions or things you do in the non-physical world because it wasn't wouldn't have direct repercussions on your life so the ultimate challenge became that we are these incredibly sp um, spiritual um, almost like divine energetic beings who are trapped in this world where we're supposed to grow and learn valuable lessons but in many ways the deck is almost stacked against us preventing us from growing and reaching these higher states because there are those individuals in, involved in all of this from the very beginning. Some of them really don't like that God figure you mentioned, who you can link to that figure of Yahweh and Jehovah, the same thing. That's not what we think of as the prime creator of all of the universe that bases everything on love and growth. It's this jealous evil figure that really doesn't want humans to reach higher states of consciousness because then we would be like them. We'd be like gods. Yes. And so yeah. that was, that's where this whole story comes in, is that our reality was actually promoted and pushed towards a very warlike and chaotic type of reality to force to trap us in these physical bodies so that we would forget who we are and be distracted by this physical world. And that's where all of the nature of reality really came in, because once I realized what I had secretly down deep inside all, knew all along was that this physical body and everything we see around us is really just an illusion and that our true essence and our energy is 
this non-physical energy that, that is all around us. To give you an example, we know that love is real. Most of us have felt it in our lives at least once. And we know that love is real. But how do you measure love? You can't measure love scientifically. How do you take some instrument to measure love? But, so does that mean it's not real? No. That's how all this comes into play is we try to prove everything on the physical basis of us understanding how it works. And we just dis, we discredit and ignore the things that are we're not able to prove, like, for instance, the spirit, spirit and consciousness and all of the aspects that go along with energy. Those things were ignored in school. And we were just made to believe that we're just this ape that is living in this survival of the fittest mentality. And we just need to oh, work really, really hard till you eventually get a good job and then you get home and then you get kids and then you just die. And that's your whole life. And then you never actually go out to seek these, these bases of knowledge that help you understand the universe and the nature of reality. And that was what really led me down to say, okay, so here we have these new theories that are coming out. Like you mentioned string theory, the idea that everything in the universe can be reduced down to these small little vibrating strings of energy that really can define everything. And I don't know if you just saw that they just had a discovery made where they are now connecting what they call the fifth element to something or the, to this thing, this connection we have with dark energy and how dark energy is this other side of the universe that almost balances and mimics the physical side of the universe. So when you really start looking at that, it becomes, it becomes almost fantastical because it's, it's like beyond what we can even comprehend and what we've been taught in school that all yeah, of this exists yeah. simultaneously around us and we can't really perceive it. Now, you talk, talk about the fact that we're not taught this at school, and that's kind of a, a real-world experience of, uh, of what we read in mythologies all around the world, that, that decisions were taken by these higher beings as to how conscious, how intelligent human beings ought to be. And there's this decision that we should, we should be down here where we could be managed. In the light of your research, how conscious can we be? How intelligent can we be? Uh, is this what, we sh what we're used to? Is this where we stay? Or do you see potential for, for us to develop? Thoth used to call humanity the children of men. He said that we were all like children that existed in a body that was like an adult, but we were, we were, we were like little children because we were so distracted by the physical world and all of these things that, that bombard us that, that most people actually never took the time to actually grow. They stayed almost as a child. And I think that that is in many ways how you could look at a lot of our society today is that we have seven and a half billion people and, and perhaps the majority of those are like children because they have gone along with this narrative, like we've this doctrine that we've been taught in school about just being an ape and that everything is just a physical world and that we're nothing special and that we're just here to... to consume the resources of our world and not care about the consequences of our actions because, hey, it doesn't matter, right? There's nothing connected to anything else. But really, the ancient cultures said the complete opposite. The ancient cultures actually stated that the real feat to conquer was actually the non-physical reality and that the physical reality was, like I said, is more of an illusion. That doesn't mean you ignore it and you, and you don't try to do well in it because you'll die, right? But it means not becoming so blinded by it that you forget about the entire other side that really defines this. Um, and, and that is in many ways what has been described in, in almost every ancient culture is that look at all these individuals throughout history. You know, some of famous figures like um, Buddha and looking at individuals like the famous biblical version of Jesus and all these other individuals who may or may not have existed. It doesn't even matter if they existed. The, the teachings they left behind and the, what they were trying to promote is the idea that we have this kingdom of heaven within us and that we ourselves have to be the ones to decide to change. We're not going to be told to do that by someone else. There isn't going to be this shepherd that comes in that leads us towards the light. We ourselves have to decide, okay, we have free will. We are eternal conscious beings in this in environment to grow and to learn new things. So, so, so once we don't forget that, then we have to take account of our own lives and say, even though these decisions seem like I have no choice, 
I always have choice based on free will. And everything that I decide to do is going to be a factor in how my life turns out. And so most people go along with these distractions and these things that come along in our reality that hold us back and they'll just sail through life with them. And then, and then by the time they die, they're sitting on their deathbed and they're wondering, what did I do with my life? You know, what, what was I doing? I, I regret so many things. And that's why I, I decided very quickly in my life that I would not only just read these things, but I would practice them and I would understand them. And that's what I did. And I was able to have experiences that go far beyond what I could ever imagine that really helped me understand that, look, all of this stuff is real. All of this stuff is just sitting there waiting for humanity to decide to wake up and pay attention. Because if each one of us decided to reach these higher states of consciousness and energy, unlocking these shockers that allow us to reach these ultimate stages of consciousness, we would essentially co ended up co-creating our own reality. We would change everything here. That's the part that people start to scratch their head and be like, what do you mean we're co-creating reality, right? That's wonderful. So if you were talking, to boil that down, if you were talking to, say, an 18-year-old, they've just yeah. finished school education, uh, they're working out what they want to do with their life, what kind of career they're looking for, how they're going to live their life, and uh, they're looking for a mentor, and they discover Matthew Lacroix uh, online or on YouTube or being interviewed on Gaia somewhere. And so they come to you and they say, Matthew, in the light of everything that you have learned so far, how should I live my life? How would you boil that down for them? Well, I would, I would tell them that it's, it's important at first that when you're young, you, you, you try to, you know, work your way through this dark, I call, I call the consciousness, I, I try to equate consciousness to the idea that we're, it's like we're in this dark forest. And we don't really have any kind of way to know which way to necessarily go because most of those easy routes, things like, well, become a lawyer to, to get tons of money and you'll be happy. All of these, as an example, all of these different routes seem like they're really easy routes to find happiness in what we're looking for, but really they're just these dead ends. They're these means to just distract us and hold us back. Whereas these very challenging paths, these seem impossible because of all the roadblocks they're actually the correct paths all along and that they, we have these struggles that we have to overcome in order to grow and learn. And I firmly believe that the first thing that needs to happen is a person that's 18 or even younger, they need to develop a basis for themselves, a, a base layer that they can fall back on their life. And what, the, what does that mean? Well, if I was with that individual or whoever it was, I would want them, like you said, to First, get out and really appreciate this world we exist in. Appreciate nature. Appreciate how incredibly beautiful it is. How many different species of life exist that are all in a perfect harmony except for us. And really notice that. And then discover this word that is basically the key to the lock to all of this. And that word is awareness. Is And one of the things I, I state in the stage of time is the key to all of this is realizing, are you aware? You know, simply ask the question, am I aware of, of, of what I'm not aware of? And that might seem like a really strange question, but sit down and ponder. Are you aware of your health? Are you aware of the, the environment that you're living in? Are you aware of the things you're doing on a daily basis? How is that impacting you? Those decisions you're making, the things you're not doing, the things you are doing, everything comes into these factors of becoming more aware of this nature of reality in this world around you. Because once you become aware of your actions, then you can change. Then you can say, well, I know that when I eat that big greasy hamburger, my vibrational frequency lowers dramatically. <laughs> so wait a minute. So what if I eat some, you know, some healthy vegetables or fruits or a piece of healthy fish? What, is, what does that do in, internally to my vibration versus some of these really bad foods? Those are those first steps that people take in, in recognizing that, wow, these things really affect my state. They really affect my conscious state and how I'm connected to understanding all these things around me. And when you start doing that and you have a basis of knowing, when I mentioned nature, knowing that that's what's real, being out there and seeing the balance of everything around you, seeing how um, everything is doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing except for us 
you can fall back on that basis and not become distracted when you're being bombarded by all these things that are going to come at you in life that are going to completely try to take away your imagination, your individualism. You know, this idea of you having decisions you can make that go beyond just what you should necessarily be doing, what you're told. That's what I would I would tell those individuals. But I would also want them to have fun. I think people need to just get out and really just enjoy yourself in this ex experience. We're not here very long. We need to realize that this is an incredible opportunity we have and we need to take it and, and, and get the most amount out of it we can. Oh, man. Of course, they should also read your books, The Illusion of Us. They're able to. Uh, the, the Stage of Time. Um, how else can people find you and follow your work, Matthew? Because I think everything you shared today is really going to whet people's appetite for, for some more Matthew Lacroix. How can people follow your work? Um, I have a website called thestageoftime.com, and I also have a YouTube at Matthew Lacroix. Um, that is L-A-C-R-O-I-X, or Lacroix in French. Um, and yes. I, um, <laughs> so can, Lacroix is the main pronunciation. Is that right? It's, it's, I guess you could call it, you can say Lacroix or Lacroix. It, it doesn't really matter. They're both ways to say it, but it, um, it's, it's fine either way. But yeah, I really appreciate everyone that supports my work. Um, the stage of time was really my bread and butter of the accumulation of, of all of the years that I've spent doing this and trying to put together just the idea of the stage of time being in the stage of the third dimension and how, just like Shakespeare said, they were all actors playing this role on this great grand stage of experience and that we all can, can be whatever character we want in that great story. And that in this physical reality, we basically decide the outcome of everything in the non-physical realities and the other dimensions. It is everything gets decided here. This is the great stage that basically decides everything. Matthew, that's, Awesome. I have really enjoyed talking to you today. We could talk for many more hours and I hope we'll have you back again on The Fifth Kind TV. But now I want to say thank you so much for joining us. We wish you every success in your research as it moves forward and look forward to catching up with you another time. Thank you, Paul. I really enjoyed our discussion so much. I hope to come back on soon. Sure thing. All the best.